So we'll pass the microphone backwards and forwards, but um, just to start off with, um, I think I'd like to go first to the pack. Um, when you take on such a very unpopular thing as corruption in South Africa, you stand up being called uh, a racist, a counter-revolutionary, an enormous amount of pressure gets, gets to bear um, on you uh, as, a, as a white liberal. Um, how was that? How was that process? How did you deal with it? And how did you keep going? Have you got three hours? <laughs> uh, I, I uh, freely admit to being a counter-revolutionary because um, the revolution actually ended in 1994. Uh, uh, Professor Carter Asmal told everybody that the revolution ended in 1994, the birth of constitutionalism in South Africa. But unfortunately, uh, too many people weren't listening when he spoke. And so we still have a revolutionary agenda uh, pursued by a lot of people, not all the people, but a lot of people in the ANC-led alliance that, that gets you into the kind of trouble we're in at the moment. The value system of the Constitution is inconsistent with the value system of the revolution. And as a consequence of that, I decided to stop practicing law because I was involved with greed, anger, and stupidity the whole time, and to get into the, the business of exacting accountability from those pursuing the revolutionary agenda. And that manifested itself in what you, you see in the book, the arms deal, the uh, demise of the scorpions and their replacement with those hawks that never come off the chain. and. Um, the Encounter scandal has also got a, a very unusual uh, take in the book because although we were not involved in the litigation, we did some things behind the scenes that you will want to read about. And there are still a few more books left. <laughs> They're just hiding under the table while the uh, booksellers have a smoke break. Um, so you are going on the record here that you're not part of MI6 or CIA. <laughs> No. There have been many books about the arms deal. I have to say that I saw another one. I thought, oh, well, you know, what possibly uh, can this, this add? Um, and, and it does. You know? um, and I want you just to perhaps update our, our audience. Um, where are we at with the arms deal at this stage? Um, what did you find that you need, needed to say about it that you didn't feel had been said before? Um, and has the brouhaha around the arms deal become almost sort of like an elite obsession when I mean, there's so much corruption on so many other levels? Um, why is it still so relevant and how does it speak to border corruption? Uh, yes, I, I think that the arms deal is the original sin of the new South Africa. Um, it was the biggest procurement in the history of South Africa. It, it was invalid for want of compliance with procurement rules. It was invalid for want of compliance with the Exchequer Act, which did not give Trevor Manuel the right to borrow the money offshore. He ought to have waited for the Public Finance Management Act to be enacted, and he ought to have got a special resolution of Parliament enabling him to borrow the money that we had to borrow to buy all of those armaments which are collecting rust or dust or worse and um, have, have been an, an incredible drain on the, the South African um, fiscus. So uh, when, when the Social Justice Coalition was screaming for a, a, an arms deal commission of inquiry, I asked the question, if they are refused, is it not irrational to refuse and should we not take it to court? And the only person who was prepared to agree with me was uh, Terry Crawford Brown. And he'd been working on it since 1995 and um, without any success. So we did that, we got the Commission of Inquiry, but the Commissioner was chosen by Jacob Zuma as a consequence of which, and there's a whole chapter about it, the Sariti Commission was a whitewash. But enough has come out in that commission for me to say with conviction 
that the procurement was invalid for want of compliance with constitutional procurement requirements for want of authority on the part of Trevor Manuel to borrow the money and because there was bribery and corruption in the deal. And that forms, and you'll find it in the book, the basis of uh, particulars of claim which we are waiting to, uh, to issue. The, the, the hold up is that Terry Crawford Brown is not listening to me anymore. He's taking his own advice and uh, you know, a bit like a dentist telling you what to do about your brain surgery. And he has decided that he wants to go directly to the Constitutional Court about it. He has papers lodged and until the Constitutional Court tells him that that is not the appropriate thing, how are they going to do that? That it's not appropriate to come directly to them with this problem. We are, are in a form of limbo. I think I've answered all of your questions in, in a way. Do you feel shortchanged? Uh, no, no, I think that, that's uh, good. Um, so, so that's where we, we are at the moment. I'm sorry to hear about you know, you know this division. Uh, no, we're still friends. <laughs> yeah. well, friends maybe, but you've got a you've got a different strategy. Yes. So, okay. So then, what's the way forward? Are we going to wait until until we hear what happens? Okay. And then, if Terry is successful, then you go to support him. Yes. Okay. With uh, with that. Um, perhaps you could just speak more broadly then um, about the importance of people like yourself um, and organizations such as the Helen Susan Foundation and those, those organizations within South Africa that are serving the purpose of the watchdog. And maybe I could also sidetrack you uh, to comment on how you feel at the moment about our current public <laughs> that, that's, that's also another three hours, but I will compress it in the interest of those who want to go, to go out. The, the, um, the situation, to answer the, the last question first, is uh, with, with the new public protector, is that in, in, in my view, the new public protector is going to be much more executive minded than Tuli Madonsela ever was. Uh, we see the signs already. I have complained to her on behalf of accountability now about the fact that was disclosed to us by Dennis Davis at a learned seminar a couple of weeks ago. The fact that the NPA is sitting, that's the National Prosecuting Authority, is sitting on 3,000 dockets which come from the public protector, which are all slam dunk cases for corrupt activities in the procurement chain in South Africa. And those cases are not being prosecuted because the accused in the cases are deployed cadres of the National Democratic Revolution. So this is clearly an instance of, of maladministration and it is clearly a way of dealing with the debt hole that the country is in at the moment. You recover the money from the baddies, you don't have to uh, collect so much tax the next year round. So we've, we've complained to the public protector, it was initially ignored, when I wrote to her personally, she jumped, within a day, she jumped and said, do this, do that, do the next thing. And then my, my good friend, Lily Gosham, Gosham, I don't know, writes for, for um, Rand Daily Mail under that nom de plume, um, revealed that in the last five years, 293 billion rand, sorry, billion rands, 293 billion rands has gone west to, to corruption in the, uh, the activities of the government. Five years, the last five years. So I gave that to the public protector this week and said to her, listen, you know, there's a lot of money involved here. For heaven's sake, get these guys into gear. It's not a, a difficult uh, investigation. Either they are or they aren't getting on with the prosecution of the people who've been stealing public money. And her answer comes back, well, we've got a backlog, and when the backlog has been worked off, then we will allocate. And, uh, well, that's a sign that the public protector is not alive to the urgency of the situation, is not prepared to, to go after the other cases, and is not going to measure up to the high standards that we've come to expect from that office under 
the uh, stewardship and leadership of Tukima and Sela. All right, so now I've got to try and remember what the other question was. You're going to help, have to help me because I got carried away. <laughs> uh, you pretty much covered it. Was, it was about the importance of... Oh, no, I, I, I don't think we're important at all. <laughs> I, I think that um, the, 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 there are really three things that are keeping South Africa going at the moment. The one is our independent media. I think without that, I don't get leads for the cases that I choose to go after and I try to be judicious about the cases I go after. The only case we've ever lost was the, the basic education case which had nothing to do with corruption and everything to do with the undermining of, of basic education by sub to and really no desire to educate children in this administration. I think that the, in addition to the media, the fact that our judiciary has not yet been captured and that we still have impartial judges who are prepared to do their duty in a manner that is without fear, favor, or prejudice is a, an, an indication that there, there is hope for us. I think that there are people shaking their heads sadly and saying that's not going to last for long. I know that a retired judge president said that the, the judiciary has had its chips, but so far it has actually held together far better than even I expected and I am as optimistic as, 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 as they come. And then, as you suggest, civil society organizations like uh, Freedom Under Law and um, uh, the uh, ODAC, uh, that, uh, sorry, sorry. <coughs> uh, Legal Resources Center, Helen Sussman Foundation, uh, Institute of Race Relations, they all bring their bit. But let me tell you a quick story because the Helen Sussman Foundation was litigation shy. And the Glenister case was short of an amicus, a friend of the court. We knew that if we went in, in the Glenister case, with Bob Glenister looking like Don Quixote without a man on an ass next to him, it might have, might have been me. Okay, so the Glenister case was about the closing down of the scorpions and their replacement with these hawks that never fly. And, <laughs> We attacked the constitutionality of what was going on. The Helen Sussman Foundation had made representations to Parliament about it, but they hadn't joined in the litigation. And through a little bit of maneuvering and quite a lot of cheek, I was able, because I was primed, and the story is in the book, to say to the new director that the old director had told me that the Helen Sussman Foundation had put a lot of time, effort and money into this. They paid for their ticket. They were entitled to see the show. And if their attorneys were not prepared to do it for no money, I would find attorneys who would do it for no money. And then I copied the attorney in the email. <laughs> so they all came to the party. They all did their duty magnificently. And we won that case on the two points that they asked by us to argue were obviously the two best points in the case. The first point, corruption is a human rights issue and therefore the state has an obligation to do something about corruption, not just close down walks and uh, close down scorpions and put nothing in their place. And the other one was that we have international obligations in terms of treaties and protocols that we have signed as a country that oblige us to have that. So, the Helen Sussman Foundation, having come in as an amicus in, in the case that was finally decided in 2011, has now developed quite an appetite for uh, public interest litigation. And I sit back and say, glory, hallelujah, I don't have to do it all myself. And I'm very pleased with, with what they are doing, because they, they have held feet to the fire with uh, what, what is going on with the Hawks at the moment. They've held feet to the fire in relation to the... Um, the business of getting rid of Mr. Abrams. They now just started a case about that. And strength, strength to the arms of the uh, underfunded and hard-working NGO sector. We do it for love, and we love doing it. Um, to return to the book, uh, you write about the bread cartel. Uh, I don't think that that's a story that's terribly well known. Um, and I think it would be helpful to, to our uh, Audience is to know a little bit more about that. Yes, um, that's that's another funny story which you, which uh, is, is is covered in the book. 
I got a phone call on a Saturday afternoon from uh, the, uh, an attorney who did his articles at the Legal Resources Centre and knows a good public interest case when he sees it. And he had been busy representing red consumers and red distributors in the Western Cape who had been victims of a collusive, fraudulent, illegal cartel that the big bread manufacturers have put together to push up the price of bread to a way, in a way that would give them greater profits and to, to reduce the commissions of the, uh, the distributors. And the case had gone a bit pear-shaped because an acting judge had been given it, or an acting judge of somewhat conservative view, and he said, sorry, I'm not going to help you in any way, shape or form. And the bread manufacturers had taken the point that you can't act for the distributors and for the consumers at the same time because the distributors might be part of ripping off the consumers and so there was a conflict of interest. And he wanted me to come in and look after the distributors because they had a much weaker case than, than the, uh, the, the consumers. And long story short, we went, we took, we, we tried to get leave to appeal without success. We went to the uh, Supreme Court of Appeal in Bloemfontein and from there to Bromfontein. And the, uh, the end of the story is that as a consequence of our intervention at the invitation of, uh, of um, Charles Abrams, the attorney in, in the matter, we became the B team who actually won the case in the sense that a general class action now exists in South African law made by the courts and not by legislation because the courts could see that this government was not going to give any uh, member of the public a stick with which to get it. So we've established a general class action for all time in uh, South African law and that's probably the biggest thing that, that, that we've ever done because it means that the little guy has the opportunity of exacting accountability in his little way through a class action. Class actions are very useful, especially for consumers, because each consumer's individual case is not worth pursuing. But if you form a class and pursue it on behalf of a class, it can be very well worth pursuing, as we see from was her name, Erin Brockovich and others, uh, who offered water to the attorney. <laughs> I'll have some water, thank you. The, do you think it's going to be the case always that the fight against corruption is going to fall to a free media, to a civil society? Do you think that's just embedded in the system for what recommendations or ideas do you have about how we could counter uh, corruption generally? I'm going to take this as the opening to punt the book that's on the table. That book is a handbook. It's a free handbook. Uh, it is the first edition and it wasn't written by lawyers. Well, I'm, I'm told that my legalese has been expurgated from, from the uh, <laughs> confronting the corrupt. But that book is now in its second edition. It has been updated right to today. It is going through its final checking by people who obsessively move commas and unsplit infinitives on my behalf and on behalf of the editors, one of whom is here today, sitting quietly in the back and pretending not to be here. That's Gail Washkansky. Stand up, Gail. She deserves recognition. That's not how you stand up here. That's much better. That, that, that new edition deserves to be in print and in every classroom or at least in every school library in the country. Because if we do not inculcate the values of constitutionalism into our people from classroom level up, we are going to find ourselves with the revolution beating the constitution and that's, to quote John B. Forster, sorry, B. John Forster, is too ghastly to contemplate. So the, the, um, the, the effort in that regard um, it goes on. We are looking for, for sponsors and we will use um, profits from the 
Tafel Berg book to it costs a lot of money to produce a handbook and it really is an expensive exercise. What was it, a quarter of a million rands for how many copies? <coughs> 25,000. Now you see that that's one for each school in the country. It really is very, very difficult to uh, to finance that sort of thing. So those of you who've got a rich uncle in the furniture business, I'm not talking about your stores. Uh, <laughs> Let's, let's, uh, let's see what you can do to get that printed and distributed. But the, the more direct answer to what do we do with corruption besides making people turn themselves from passive subjects of an authoritarian order into active citizens of a constitutional order um, is that we need to get popular groundswell, which is one of the main reasons why I wrote this book. Besides to make uh, Jill and Jean and Erica happy, they, they regard me as, as their um, a, a, a adopted child. You know, the, the National Book Handel thinks that the authors are the most important people on earth, but the authors think that the book reading public are the most important people on earth, so we, 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 we get on well together like that. The way to deal with corruption is to have machinery of state that is able to prevent, combat, investigate, prosecute, and punish the corrupt in an effective and efficient way. In the South African context, we have a binding judgment of the Constitutional Court that says that anti-corruption machinery must have five attributes. Specialization, which means you don't do all the priority crimes, you do corruption. Training, which means that you're smarter than the corrupt, which is a difficult thing to achieve. Independence, which means that you're able to act without fear of pain or prejudice. Resources, and that is resources that are guaranteed, that cannot have the executive standing on the, the oxygen pipe every time things get hot. And most important, and this is what the Scorpions didn't have, security of tenure of office. And all of that uh, boils itself down into a five-letter acronym, STIRS, Specialized, Trained, Independent, Resourced, and Secure in Tenure of Office. The way to do that in our constitutional order, in order to give proper effect to the binding decision of the Constitutional Court that was won in that Gettysburg case, where Helen Sussman came and saved our bacon for us, is to create an integrity commission as a new Chapter 9 institution, because Chapter 9 institution can't just be closed down by a simple uh, majority, and to put specialized and trained people in there, have a judge lead it, or have somebody who's got the, the credentials that are judge-like to lead it, and to develop the esprit de corps that we know existed in the Scorpions. The Scorpions were all South Africans, they were trained by FBI and Scotland Yard, but we were able to be so efficient with our anti-corruption work that the Scorpions had to be closed down so that Jacob Zuma and his mates did not go to jail. It's as simple as that. That's what happened. So, if you, if you don't get any other message out of today, STIRS and an integrity commission that is imbued with the STIRS characteristics is in fact the only way that we will get out of the hole we are in in relation to corruption. And our Chief Justice, bless him, has said corrupt, everybody knows corruption is rife and we're in danger of it, this is his term, graduating into something terminal. Now, uh, this is not me making scare stories, this is the Chief Justice writing a judgment in which the Constitutional Court tried to turn the sow's ear that the hawks are into a silk purse, I'm afraid without success. So there's work to be done on this and the Parliamentary uh, Constitutional Review Committee is in fact considering draft legislation and a constitutional amendment that we have given to them in April this year in which they are busy processing with a view to, to taking the matter forward and uh, with, with 58 people not voting in, 
in, in the no confidence debate yesterday. Those were the ones who didn't come, not the ones who came. Uh, we've got, I think we, we've got a glimmer of hope that Parliament will do its duty for a change. But if they don't, we will go back to the Constitutional Court and say, sorry guys, you didn't get it right last time. Look what has happened. Look at what a mess the Hawks are. Let's try again. Let's do what Mr. Glenister asked you to do, which is to take your anti-corruption machinery out of the police, because the police have no place to have anti-corruption machinery. Ask Andrew Brown. Um, well, then, just to bring it to a close before we open up for questions, I want to hold on to that, what you call a glimmer of hope, um, and to say that obviously you could possibly be doing the kind of work that you do do unless you are some kind of optimist. And then perhaps people become despondent and discouraged when they're not actively fighting, when they're not actively participating, they just throw up their hands and sit back and feel disempowered and say, what can we possibly do about this kind of way of corruption? Do you not feel that, uh, and compared to many countries on the continent, uh, just because they are our neighbours and around, that South Africa hasn't done too badly, um, that under the concerted assault from a head of state, very few institutions in many countries that I can think of, even advanced uh, de democracies, um, can really resist that kind of assault. Um, and that we have seen pockets of resistance. Uh, obviously, two of them said being the most well known, but actually there have been pockets of resistance all over in many, many institutions. Um, that maybe we haven't done as badly, um, and it's a matter of encouraging those and supporting those. How do you, how do you feel about that on the optimistic scale? Well, I think that uh, any South Africans of any hue, and I deny being a racist, I admit being a counter-revolutionary, but any South African of any hue that has not uh, moved away from South Africa is here because of, uh, shall I call it, innate optimism. We've got so much going for us, and we cannot sit back and allow a gang of corrupt for politicians and their fellow travellers to capture a country as precious as ours. It, it seems that our new public protector um, has worked for the State Security Agency and did spend time in our embassy in China. Whether she's a spy or not is, is an assertion made by the, uh, the, the DA. I'm not that concerned about whether she's a spy or not. What I'm concerned about is whether she is able to act impartially and independently to protect the public rather than to protect the executive branch of government and those who run the affairs of state and parliament and elsewhere. So I don't know whether she was a spy or not. She claims that she wasn't. Um, her, her pay slips have never been made uh, public and she has said that in due course she will deal with those allegations but who knows when due course will talk. And the answer is that we were in fact given all of 20 minutes to talk about uh, this idea of uh, an integrity anti-corruption body. We were not interrupted. We were given a courteous hearing by Vincent Smith, who has reinvented himself in, in, uh, as chairman uh, in recent years. The DA members of that committee are Vinus Breitenbach, who takes no prisoners like, like me, and uh, James Self, who's been there long enough to know what day of the week it is. Floyd Shabambu is on that, so he makes things happen. And best of all, and this happened too late for me to put in the book, unfortunately. When a visiting Indonesian delegation of parliamentarians visited that committee on the day that they were washing up on all of these submissions before their night, the Indonesians said, don't you guys have any impeachment machinery in South Africa? And the, the answer was, yes, we do. And um, by the way, we regard, say, say, this committee that you have no faith in, the submissions that have been made in relation to an integrity commission as so important 
that we are not going to just deal with it in the, in the usual course. We are going to have a special meeting about it either later this year, or if there are too many impeachment debates or uh, further uh, no confidence debates early next year. So uh, I, I think they have to be given a chance. I don't think it would be appropriate for us to go back to court while they are, are sitting on it. And uh, one of the things we would say in court is, look, you reinvented the, the, the turbocharged Hawks by changing the Hawks legislation in order to try and get the Hawks to be stirs compliant. It hasn't worked. Look at Burning at Lameza. Look what happened to Anwar Ramat. Look what happened to Johan Boysen. Where is Mr. Sabia now? He's working for the DA in Johannesburg instead of for the Hawks in Pretoria. Well, in fact, he was our team chief. And that kind of factual matrix supplemented by a refusal of Parliament to get involved, tells the court, <clears throat> well, yes, it's true, the Hawks are not operating as an efficient and effective anti-corruption entity, and Parliament doesn't seem to be prepared to do anything about it. Now, are they fully compliant with our STIRS criteria, or aren't they? And if the answer is they aren't, then some, the court has to do something simple as that, because you have to comply with the Constitution, and we know from Genesis 2, which was in 2011, that that means you have to have effective and independent anti-corruption machinery of state, and you have to comply with your international obligations under the United Nations uh, Convention Against Corruption, the AU, and the SADC Protocol of the Power of Corruption, all of which require us to have independent machinery. Because without the independent machinery, you're on a hiding to nothing. The likes of Jacobs who you know, just come in and drive a bus through the system, as we have experienced so far. But I'm not as pessimistic as you. I take your point. But it's how it was. So I asked you, is it, has it improved? Yeah. It looks now, as I, if it I has. Think, I, I, I think Vincent Smith is in the, in the process of reinventing himself. And I think there are a lot of people within the ANC who've realized that without strong institutions, UN Sustainable Development Goal Number 16, strong institutions of state. If you don't have those, then you get ploughed under. And we will be ploughed under if we persist with the Hawks. It's not going to happen. And, and South Africa will have the ratings downgrade, will degenerate into a failed state over the next five years. But if we turn our back on the corrupt by confronting them, as the post to be highly suggests, and if we are all active citizens in pursuit of the, the goals of our constitution and in the building of the institutions that make that possible, then the sky's the limit. We are potentially the engine room of the entire continent and we can do well uh, if we can get our, our brains into the right space and our politicians too. No brains. The, the answer to your question is that the, the corruption is from top to bottom and the psychodynamics of it are very interesting. Uh, research has shown that in any given population there are 10% of people who are incorruptible. We're all here today. There are tens of percent of people who are always corrupt no matter what. And the 80% in between can go either way depending on the circumstances in which they find themselves in society. So if it is a, a very egalitarian society, a homogeneous, a, a prosperous, at peace, then there's no need to be corrupt because you get what you want and you can have your beer on Friday nights and you know, life goes on. But if you're in as unequal a society as South Africa, where there is a culture of impunity. The problem is that the value system of that revolution that we started out on is incompatible with the value system of the Constitution. And a lot of people in, in positions of power who can spend public money are working on the basis that you know, th this is our turn to eat, and we're going to eat as much as we like because we are busy working towards 
the hegemonic control of all the levers of power in a one-party state in which party and state become one and there's this hegemony. Now, the, the corruption in South Africa, because it extends all the way to JZ 783 charges unanswered, to the traffic cop who asks you for cold drink money and, and the roadblock, um, it, it's, it's like that because there is impunity. It, that is a circumstance that breeds corruption. If the impunity is dealt with because you see some big fish getting caught and getting punished, and the last big fish to be caught was uh, Jackie Salevi, who is long dead, and the last uh, big fish to be convicted is John Block, who is an obscure politician from Kimberley, but nobody else big has been has been caught in the New South Africa. So the, the culture of impunity is abroad and it's doing well. If the system is changed and the uh, police are encouraged to go after the corrupt, in, this is from the gold of money to the uh, commission on the nuclear deal, things will get better from top to bottom. But there, there is the geography is pervasive. It's rife in the words of the, of, of the Chief Justice. And if you go onto the Constitutional Court website and search under the name Genesis, you'll find the papers in this case that give you enough material to write for the Norwegian newspapers for the next 10 years on how bad it is in the United States. The, the, the answer to your question is that there is no provision for amnesty in our law. Uh, the the um, president, like everybody else, is equal before the law. If he is convicted of some crime or other, it is possible for his successor to pardon him. That's what happened to Richard Nixon in America, and it is a feasible solution. You could get, for example, and you've all got to uh, watch what Sue is doing on Monday, because we're putting out a press release on Monday. If you can't wait till Monday, just go to our website now and you'll see what it's all about. But it'll get oxygen on Monday. We are going to ask the uh, National Director of Public Prosecutions to bring a simple, discreet corruption case against Zuma and the Minister of Justice because they corruptly fired the previous National Director of Public Prosecutions. And if they refuse to do that, we will ask them for the necessary certificate that will enable us to do it. And I will come to another press club with a big hat and pass the hat around to, to put us in funds to brief counsel to do it. We have opinion from two senior counsel of the Cape Bar, which is to the effect that the way that Mr. Fasana was fired was a corrupt activity under the legislation that she made. So that could be done, and you could convict him and sentence him to 15 years, which is the minimum sentence, and get his successor to say, okay, for the sake of peace and quiet, you stay in Kandla and, and, and you pardon, and we all get on with the rest of our lives without too much uh, drama. That is the, the, the scenario that can be played out. But the idea of an amnesty when he doesn't even admit to doing anything wrong, is, is, is a non-starter. He is equal before the law. That poster that says, no one is above the law, or number one is above the law, <laughs> depending on how you read it, is, is the way to look at it. <laughs> it's a small dot. Somewhere it looks like fly dirt, but it's actually... <laughs> All right, now to get to the most important question I've been asked all afternoon. How do ordinary people do anything to stop corruption? And the answer is, do not get yourself involved in corruption, which means don't give the gold of money to the man with the roadblocks. Below the whistle, you can do it. ODAC exists as an organization. What's it? The Open Democracy Advice Center. It exists as an organization to help whistleblowers. So if you become aware of corruption, whether it's with the school books at school, or with uh, what is happening with the mowing contract for the pavements in, in the municipality, whatever, 
blow the whistle, know that if there is maladministration that may not be corruption, you can ask the public protector to go after it. She will do that kind of case. It's just the big ones that she won't. Know that if your human rights are threatened or infringed, the Human Rights Commission is there to look after you. Know that if your husband is beating you up, there's a gender commission that can deal with that systemically. All of those things are there, they are in place, and they are for free. If you are aware of corruption, like we became aware of corruption when we read the newspaper about the Kassan appeal, you go to your local police station and you fill in a form and say, please investigate corruption around this set of facts that I read about in the newspaper or that I know about because I'm on the PTA or the church committee or the Rate Payers Association. How about not paying taxes? Not paying taxes is illegal and I will come and visit you in prison because we need the taxes. Okay. So, of course, the other thing that you can do is, is give your, your time and your support to organizations like Accountability Now. We, 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 we run on the smell of an oil rag. We have six directors and all of them are volunteers. We do not draw salaries. The, uh, the operations officer draws salary because she has to feed her cat and uh, our, our bookkeeper does peace work for us. So, yeah, we, we, we could do with your help and you will feel better for helping us because at least you will know that your money is being well spent and you get a tax deduction for giving us money, which means that you have to pay less tax. So rather than go to jail for not paying tax, give us the money that you intend to give to the tax man and get a, what's it called Benny, a section 18A certificate from us so, so, so that your tax position is in Okay, thank you.